You're listening to Cherishing Scripture Podcast, a podcast that's changing society by cherishing Scripture. Why do you need to carry an amulet around in your pocket that says WWJD to remind you what Jesus would do? Isn't that the Holy Spirit's job? But it seems like a lot of men are trying to manufacture this difference as opposed to letting it naturally happen. Exactly. And the exactly Bible, right. the Bible naturally changes people and makes them different. In debates, when you get in a debate with someone, you know that you've won the debate when they turn personal. Yeah. They're attacking these preachers that are standing for their liberty. And right. when they can't find anything biblically wrong with this person, they start picking out other things. Yeah. And if you don't think that those two things can overpower and overtake you, you're pretending. Right. And now here's your hosts, Pastor Brad Bailey, Adam Capps, Zach Taylor, and Jeremy Boggs. We're back in the studio again. It's been a little bit. It's been a few weeks. We took a nice little break for the holidays, but we're back. Welcome to Cherish and Scripture Podcast. We've got Adam Capps here, Pastor Brad Bailey, and Zachary Taylor behind the sound booth there. Man, it's been a lot of stuff happening these past few weeks. Yep. Yeah, we're back to normal Sunday school hours, so we got all our classes. All I think that's going to be change, great. But the classes are back to normal again, and um, lots of different stuff. One of us is betrothed. Who's that? Yeah, man, we got to bring that yeah, up. Yeah, clap, 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 clap. Come clap. on now. Yeah. Jeremy's going in the service. <laughs> Jeremy's getting locked down. Sorry, yeah. Jeremy. Game yeah. over. So I, I finally <laughs> broke, and so did my bank account, and proposed to her <laughs> Jeremy Owens that's gonna be awesome that's not gonna, that's <laughs> gonna be awesome that won't be it but anyways um, we're back in this book that Pastor Brad Bailey wrote called Toxic Traditions we have been through probably about four maybe five of those points already you can go back and catch those um, in the description below they'll have a um, uh, link there but real quick before we actually mention that we actually got a website now Church of Scripture yes. Podcast has a website looks great um, it's um, You can listen to all the episodes on there. There's videos on there. Um, you can see everything that we've done pretty much on that website. Um, there'll be actually a spot where we're actually fixing to release a, a newsletter. I actually showed Pastor a little bit of a test of one that came out, and I'll show you guys as well before we do it. But you can sign up there on your email and, and receive um, special things for uh other things that anybody else won't receive as long if you sign up for that email there. So yeah, and when less. you go to the home page, it, uh, can yeah, I get special if, gifts for if you sign up there. I'll sign you up. Sure can. Look, put your email. I'll use one of my burner emails, man. Yeah. So yeah. make sure you sign up for that. That's coming out really, really soon. We're just adding a little more finishing touches to it, but we'll be sending that out um, pretty soon. So it looks it's looking really good. Yeah. But anyways. We're going back to these talk traditions again. It looks like we, Adam's got the page open. And it looks like, I'm going to say he's going to read that for us. He'll read that first point. Maybe we'll cover a few of them. We'll see how it goes. See if we can finish this page out. All right. So the one I think we're on here is number one, two, three, four, five. Number five. It says, when a pastor replaces the Lord Jesus Christ as the functional head of the church and then leaves the church mindlessly disoriented, Devastated and terminally headless when he resigns, he has crossed the line into inordinate pastoral authority. Mm. So we got people, we got chickens running around without heads, having <laughs> no idea what to do. You know, I will out. say though, I feel like this is an easier trap to fall into. Um, and sometimes I think a pastor can do this uh, intentionally, and sometimes I think it can happen, you know, without them even realizing that it's happening if that makes sense at all meaning that um i know there are some churches where the pastor builds it and he, he just has maybe a certain personality or you know has a certain draw to him and y you have churches that will really start to members will go just because that pastor is there but then when he leaves once again like it says they're kind of headless without it which is dangerous because i think that even if it's accidental, I think the point of the church is to point people to Christ. Yeah. And having this effect on people where they look up to you in such a way to where they don't know how to follow Christ without you there to help them right. is dangerous. But yeah. I think, oh, I guess what I'm saying at this is if we're not careful, I feel like this is something that can happen pretty easily in a church. Compared to others, you have to be pretty intentional to do. But this one, even by accident in a way you could, could happen start doing this in yeah. a way it's very true yeah this makes me um 
actually think about something we talked about in Bible college. We just finished Ephesians. So I'm going to like brag on uh, or show off my, my 100, 200% on both my tests real quick here. And, and Zach is teaching it <laughs> in his Sunday school class. But it makes me think about when um, Paul in chapter 1 was talking about Christ pos- Christ's position versus our position. Yeah. Um, he said that in, in verse 20 of chapter 1, he says, "Where uh, which he wrought in Christ, which he raised from the dead and set him up in uh, on his right hand in heavenly places, far above all principalities and powers and might and domain and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also that which is to come, mm-hmm. and hath put all things under his feet and give and gave him to be the head over all things to the church." which is his body in the fullness of him that fulfilled in all, all yeah. in all. I think Paul actually talked about this a lot. In fact, I believe it's in first Corinthians. I want to say first Corinthians. He actually said to them, be followers of me as yeah. I am of Christ That's yeah. right. saying, follow me as I follow Christ, which I think I was talking to my Sunday school about it today uh, because we were talking about, um, we're in that lovely chapter where you're talking to teenagers about husbands and wives. Uh, but I talked to him about like, how is it supposed to be or how does the Bible intend it? And really, uh, he says it very plainly in Ephesians that it's supposed to be like a husband and wife relationship. It's supposed to signify Christ in the church. And I believe that the pastor's role in the church is to actually point people to Christ to follow Christ. It's supposed yeah. to be the idea there. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a <clears throat> real fine line that a pastor has to walk when it comes to this sort of thing because they are not to replace the Je- that Jesus Christ as the head of the church. Exactly. They are to be a shepherd of the sheep. That's something that's laid out pretty clearly in the New Testament. Um, but I think it often does slip into them slowly becoming the headship and then you have people I wish I could remember which book it was in but talking about how I'm of Paul and I'm of or these other people are for, of Apollos. First right. Corinthians. First yeah, that's, Corinthians. that's in First Corinthians? Corinthians? Okay, yeah. I thought maybe that it might have been. <clears throat> That right there is they're they're replacing Jesus Christ with somebody else as their headship, right? Mm-hmm. And that's super dangerous because what happens to Apollos? What happens to Paul if he were to fall away from the faith? Obviously, that didn't happen historically, but if your pastor were to fall away, oftentimes they do. Then your faith specifically gets destroyed because of it. Yeah, yeah. you know it's interesting you brought that up because this week I was in a conference up in North Florida, and uh, the host pastor and I were just talking about. Um, preachers who preach and pastor for a length of time and then get born again. Mm. Uh, and this is happening. You know, this is, this is really taking place and there's no shame in getting born again. I'm not yeah. saying that, but the issue is that many of them just continue right in the saddle and never even, you know, take a break or, or reevaluate or recalibrate or anything. And so it becomes a qualification issue for me. I mean, you Absolutely. know, Scripture talks about not a novice, less being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. And so I'm concerned about that. But what uh, a secondary concern, uh, you know, going back to what you were saying, Adam, is that, uh, uh, you know, what about the all these converts that supposedly got saved under their Oof. ministry while they were lost? I mean, what kind of confusion does that cause? And so, um, you know, that that is a considerable problem. Um, uh, but the issue, I think you guys hit it just exactly right. I mean, when you started this out there, Zach, I think you got it exactly right. You know, the issue is, um, it's not an authority thing. You know, it's okay for a pastor to have, uh, authority that is granted to him from scripture, but it's when that authority begins to compete with the authority of, of the scripture and competes with the authority of Christ in a person's life that that pastor becomes, uh, the head of the church. And, And one of my Bible college teachers told us, you know, without uh, mincing words. I mean, he said, look, uh, Jesus is the universal invisible head of the church, but the pastor is the local visible head of the church. Mm -hmm. And that didn't really sit well with me when he said it all those years ago. But even now today, I can can say that I just, I fundamentally disagree with that. I just don't think the pastor is represented anywhere in Scripture as being the head of the church. Yeah, and I think that that becomes dangerous because um, what happens is instead of pointing people to the Bible or pointing people to prayer, you start giving them your advice or your opinion on how the situation should be handled. Exactly. Which can become terribly dangerous because no matter what position you're in, you still are subject to sin just like anyone else. You're subject to making a bad decision and pointing people to follow your leadership could be extremely dangerous. And one of the things... 
you know, this we're against sin four square. We're not condoning sin or advocating sin, ministry sin, or any other uh, any other type. But one of the things that really is at play here is uh, when a pastor sets himself up in that kind of position, and when he is appreciated as the head of the church, whether he is stating it or not, um, he cannot sin. He cannot because if he does. It's going to create a shock wave that runs through that church. Uh, so, a church is like ours, and again, I'm not I'm not advocating sin, but in churches like ours, where the pastor is in an appropriate relationship with the scripture, with the church, the church knows where the final authority rests. If I were to commit a sin, if I were to, I don't know. Let's just say if I uh, um, got arrested on bounce checks all right or something like that you know we're not talking about a necessarily a moral thing here we're talking about something that could be pardoned something that could be uh, uh you know the church could look at that and say you know what this is not a disqualifier he needs to take some time off maybe or something of that nature um, in a church like ours that could potentially work but when the when a pastor is held up in such high esteem in these other churches and then he commits a sin like that, every finger gets pointed at him. And so pastors don't understand. They're putting themselves into an irrational situation. They're putting themselves into a situation where every single day they have to be perfect. They have to mm. they have to either be perfect or feign perfection because if the head if they are the head of the church and the head of the church sins, uh you know, one teacher taught us when a preacher sins, he preaches sin, and so it's uh, it's necessary that they really maintain a an, a stellar testimony. And quite frankly, you know, I don't think there are many today that have that kind of a stellar testimony. I mean, we all have faults and issues, right? And so there's uh, grace for a pastor who knows his place. There is no grace for a pastor who is pretending to be the head of the church. Yeah, well said. Yeah, you have to ignore a lot of scripture to replace <laughs> Jesus Christ as the headship. Seriously, of the I mean, <laughs> the majority yeah. of that Bible statement you that statement yeah. came from a man with a PhD in in religion with emphasis in Bible. Yeah, I was shocked, you know, because it, it was actually, he actually preached that in my church, and he he made the statement. He said Jesus is the the universal invisible head of the church, but the pastor is the local visible head of the church. Mm-hmm. I find that to be Frighteningly yeah, yeah. unscripted. See, once again, it's but to me, it's, it's so simple because even um, on smaller things, it's so easy to start taking a little credit here or a little credit there. Or if you're a pastor and you come to the church and the church is small and now the church has a larger attendance, you're like, man, look what I have done here. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, and the people look at you like, yeah. Man, I remember like Moses. Yeah, right, yeah. exactly. And the savior of the church, deliverer but of the people. I, I have seen those churches that have yeah. started small and blown up with a certain pastor and right. have blown up to large numbers. And then when that pastor leaves, they just dwindle down to nothing yeah. Yeah. and eventually close. And the reason is, is because uh, the church was built and focused on the personality of the pastor. And I think I want to make sure that I'm clear here i don't mean pastors who plan stuff or have activities i know every church has different personalities based on the pastor we've talked about that some brother bailey and uh one pastor that i know of uh, brother wiley uh, he has a ton of activities on the calendar so i don't think it's necessarily having activities on the calendar or planning events and stuff like that but i think it's more of a getting people to follow you, to follow right. your leadership, to uh, before they go to read their Bible. You know, you talked about this today. You yeah. said in some of your problems, you would sometimes be tempted to go to someone else before you'd be wanting to go to the Bible. And I think that that's the danger is a lot of church members are milk fed because the only Bible they get is the one their pastor tells them. And then the only counseling they ever get is from when they need something some form of advice from their pastor. Yeah. So they have, even though the pastor doesn't feel like he is intentionally doing it by allowing these things or not pushing people to scripture, he has in fact made himself in that position. That's correct. 
even though it wasn't intentionally. But you can't, you know, it's inevitable in some cases for you to be put in that position by certain people. Right. Because you're going to get compliments and there's going to be little old ladies that pat you on the hand and say, Pastor, you're just such a blessing and that was such a powerful <laughs> word. And then you have some church members who are very uh, brutally honest with you. Very, I don't very. Know anybody like that. What are y'all talking about? <laughs> <laughs> but you, you have to deflect those things. You know, I mean, the, the, I purposefully determine to. To, to be as, as humble as I can when it comes to compliments like that and deflect those things. I deflect it onto God's Word. You know, like, for example, this weekend in this conference I was in, you know, this little lady came to me afterwards and she said, I just, I'm just so glad that you're here. And I immediately said, I'm glad the Bible's here. That's interesting. You got to deflect it onto the Word. You got to, right. hey, it's a good book. It's not, I know, I know it has a little bit to do with the preacher and the student, but. You got to put the emphasis on the Bible and the emphasis on the Spirit of God, and give God credit and give God glory. Otherwise, you're competing with Him for that glory. It's interesting to see that because <clears throat> I've been meditating on uh, this this concept similar to that um, about how a lot of the things that I say that can be deemed by some people to be wise did not originate with me, and so therefore mm. it would be <clears throat> fraud for me to yeah. accept compliment on those things and that's how i feel about the word of god the word of god for me to accept compliment on the wisdom of something that i'm saying if what i'm saying is just literally came out of the word of god is is fraud the bible is what should be complimented that's true you being the pastor mm. it is your job to bring the bible to the to the people and we obviously compliment you because like you know it's yeah. it's hard to come by but, you know who we, we, well. we were just chit-chatting and i know we'll probably be uh rubbing the fur a little bit the wrong way here but uh we, you know we've been yeah, we've already been labeled. We may as well go ahead and just fly our flag, right? But we were we were talking. Jolly Roger. Yeah, <laughs> we, we were um, uh, we, we were talking before we started recording here today about evangelism, um, and and hosting evangelists and so on and so forth. They they really operate on that mentality of you know five um, star studded messages five sugar stick messages, five attention getting messages and 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 then it's kind of flash in the pan. That's that's they burn out. You know? And so they they need that celebrity status. You know, here, the evangelist is coming this week, and let's see what he's bringing in his briefcase. What does God have for us this week? You Time know, what, for me to get sick that Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> Adam's not a fan of evangelism. You know, neither it's am I. actually crazy. Oh. I was thinking about this this past week, and I don't know how you could potentially do a study on it, but I really want to do one on having one person preach something and then s someone who is maybe – esteemed higher quote unquote preach the same message but their own way and noticing the difference in oh like, listen altar call yeah because you, it's crazy if you preach a message here on something and then an evangelist comes in and preaches that same exact message yeah i guarantee the altar call would probably go have a big altar triple, call right because People feel like and oh, then the people, evangelist is here. Yeah, and then people leave special. saying, "Well, what, what's wrong with our pastor? You know, why can't why can't our pastor create such results?" And this is one of the fundamental problems I have with evangelism. But you know, and what you're saying is spot on. It's First Corinthians again. You know, we've been dancing around in First Corinthians here for a little while today. But in First Corinthians, it says, "If there are multiple preachers present," it's not the exact quotation, of course, but if there are multiple preachers, or they called it prophets present. Uh, he said uh, there should only be one or two to prophesy, and he said let one prophesy and let another judge. That's exactly what he said. Right. Let one prophesy and let another judge. That That's the same passage where he goes down and says let all things be done decently and in order. And uh, that passage when he says let another judge, it literally means that the preacher preaches and then he defers to the comments of yeah. of other preachers who are present in the congregation, whether positive or negative, he defers to those comments. Now, let's triangulate that for just a second, okay? Let's let's triangulate that and put it where it goes, okay? That's not an Old Testament passage, mm -hmm. all right? That is, not a, that is not a gospel passage, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. That is church epistle. Right. 
So we're talking about something that we're supposed to be doing in the services that are conducted in the local church, and it would save a a, a mountain of problems. You're talking uh, about saving a mountain of problems. Yeah. That concept right there, if that could just simply be applied to um, – not to preventing novices from becoming pastors because you're talking about uh, this morning about being on a uh, a board uh, um um ordination council yeah council or yeah that ordination council right yeah if there were enough people there that can honestly judge people as to whether or not they are a novice in scripture you prevent a whole lot of whole lot. noobs coming out and and trying to be a pastor of a church and then ending up what leaving the church then leaving them run around like a right. chicken with their head cut off right yeah, exactly we don't need those kind of people trying to you take know, churches it's sad uh, because exactly right i've heard this term before you know i think pastor you've mentioned about young pastors is a lot of times their first church is like almost like a sacrifice Ugh. in a it's way like a boot because camp. yeah it was for me because they're novices and either the church kills them or they kill the church or they kill and, the church and it's, it's so unfortunate, but I do believe – it's funny you mentioned that, Adam, and I think that's another topic for another day. <laughs> it probably but is. my idea of what a novice is versus what the what the majority is uh, for a novice is completely different because I believe a lot of people get into pastoring way too early, yeah. and it's dangerous, quite frankly, because I think this is one of the ones, once again, Bible mentions very specifically when it talks about a novice – Saying, lest he be lifted up pride. with pride. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And yeah. we all know guys who are savage novices. You know, we were talking about one recently, I think, among the three of us. We all know guys who are just savage novices. They are killing churches. And this is a shame to their home church. Their, their home That's church exactly ordained right. them. Yeah. Their home church... Uh, license them and put them out there, and that delegitimizes your ordination. Of course, yeah. it does. Completely. Like I said, your, of course, your authority to for me, mine's people, vastly different. But I've talked to Jackie about it. I was like, the only way I see myself pastoring is if, like, because I believe, like, I, you know, Adam and you and I have talked about like the desiring a good thing. Like, I love to preach. I love to teach. I love to do those things. But actually, pastor and run a church is completely different to me. Yeah, and I, I believe the only way that it would really work out for me doing that is if I was in my mid to late 30s. And then at that point, then I would enter a time of training. So I probably wouldn't start until my late 30s, early 40s. Would well, Jesus didn't start until he was 30. Bible college? Is that what you mean by training, no. Zach? <laughs> I, I, told, I actually told Jackie about it because another thing, like with – and this isn't this position isn't in the Bible, but uh, being a youth director, I'm like, I really, you know, being a youth director, I don't want to be that old guy that's a youth director. They yeah. can't relate to the kids. And by yeah. that time, I already want to have someone trained to be yeah. in that spot. But yeah. uh, once I'm done with that, then I would begin a time of, you know, learning. Like, say, if Pastor Bailey's still here, then I would take time from learning from Pastor Bailey and learning the things that he does and how to run a church, not just you yeah, know, the preaching a aspect of, of it, but the, in that. Sure. the financial aspect, the actual maintenance, everything that goes on in a pastor's role. And then from there, after a time of training, then I would probably look at my ordination. But it yeah. definitely would it's not a, be when I was 28. Yeah, I agree. You know Jer Jeremy, it's like the Ezra men yeah. you know, that you were referring to a couple of uh, months ago. I think it was in Sunday school. We talking about men of understanding, yeah. you know. Uh, and and that understanding, you know, is, is not just talking about book knowledge. Book knowledge is wonderful. I've got loads and loads of that. But if there's no wisdom to go along with it, right. if there's no application to go along with it, then uh, uh, you know, if you haven't learned how to be a people person, yeah. and if you haven't learned how to overcome uh, certain temptations to be greedy or to be covetous, um, you know, you, you're more dangerous than you are helpful. And we talked about a little bit, like a little bit of that today in Sunday school talked about how there's a difference between being having understanding being wise and having knowledge uh, knowledge is accumulating those ac accumulating those truths and then understanding is a uh, is like an apprehension of those truths right being able to grasp it and fully understand it right. and then wisdom is the application of mm -hmm. those truths you have to be able to apply it to your life Makes sense. Um, so you have to have all three yeah. but the hard part for me with this point is 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 um, it's like jumping out of a plane without a parachute you are in dangerous, dangerous circumstances with trying to agree. compete with and Jesus James Christ. Said that too. Agreed. I mean, it's you're, 
if you find ignore if you don't want to talk you don't want if you don't want to listen to Paul in Ephesians you don't want to listen to Paul in, in Corinthians look what Jesus said in the New Testament he said on this rock I will build my church right not not Peter will exactly. build my church not Pastor Bailey not Zach he said I will build my church exactly. so you have to ignore a major major part part in your yeah. Bible to to compete do you i mean my question to these pastors would be do you really think you're sitting in heavenly places with jesus christ right now no. do, oh man do no. you really think that your name is above no, all outrageous. names just like jesus christ's name is all above all names outrageous yeah i mean it's it's i just can't get past that you're in dangerous some waters, people act man. like they do though yeah. yeah yeah but once again and then what's crazy is those pastors would tell you well no i don't think that they just believe I think that what happens is pastors believe that they have more of a responsibility than what was actually given to them in Scripture. Yeah, no it's pastor, right no it's pastor right. is ever going to admit to what we're talking about today. Every mm-hmm. one of them is going. You know, every pastor thinks he's an expositor, and they're not. And every pastor thinks that he is a model and a, and a good example. And most of the time, we're not. And so, uh, they're not going to admit and say, "Yeah, I'm competing with Jesus for the, you know to be the fourth member of the Trinity." They're not going to say that. I heard but, a. I heard a thing this week, a message from this week that I saw on Twitter. I, I, I want to play it, but I don't know if we should, <laughs> but this little clip. But he literally said that the man of God and Jesus Christ is one and the same. He's, I'm I serious. think I saw that on I'm Twitter. Serious. I wish, can I, should we you play could, it? Can what I play you should it? do, yeah. uh, plug it in in the video. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. and then the I'll video. show you guys afterwards. Because it. Well, I don't want to show this guy's face. I'm not, I'm not going to be that low. But yeah, um, Just the audio. We'll play the, the audio or something. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it was bad. Was it an evangelist? No, it was a pastor's son. If you follow Christ correctly, you're going to follow the man of God correctly. If you follow the man of God correctly, you're going to follow Christ correctly. They're one and the same. What I would say oh, is, wow. is if you're one of these pastors, if you're any pastor, an intellectually honest man, <clears throat> if you're a man, how about that? We're just going to broaden it to that. If an intellectually honest man will question himself mm-hmm. and say, am I that? <clears throat> and you allow the word of God to determine whether you are or you are not, and you deal with it accordingly. If you're the guy who's going to sit there and say, oh, I'm definitely not that. Yeah. Well, maybe you are. Yeah. Well, you know, we the talk about these people that run around without their heads, uh, with their heads cut off because they don't know what to do about their pastor. It's partly, it is the majority of the pastor's fault because he taught them how to love him and not love Christ. And he taught them how to Ooh. follow him and not follow Christ. Because yep. if he was following Christ, yeah. Yeah. they would be fine. Yeah. They wouldn't. They wouldn't be running around acting like That's they didn't right. know what to do. We got like thirty seconds left, but let me kind of let me throw this out. You guys are using Warren Wiersbe's books in the college for yeah. textbooks. When Warren Wiersbe pastored, um, he 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 told a couple of the folks in his church, some of the closer inner circle people in his church. He told him, he said, "Look, I'm getting ready to resign." And uh, and this one particular family said, "Doctor Wiersbe, you cannot resign this church because we cannot live without you here." Mm-hmm. And he said, "That's exactly why I'm resigning." Yeah. Because he said, I've become too much the functional head of this church, and this church needs to, needs to depend on Jesus Christ more. And so he resigned, and the church blossomed afterwards. But that's because Warren Wiersbe built that church on God's Word. Yeah. You know, and So we, we, we have to have the foundation of Scripture. Otherwise, somebody else is going to attempt to be that foundation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can't serve, you can't serve too much. Good talk, guys. Really good. Yep. So great, great conversation. Uh, like I said, you can check all of these out on our website, our brand new website, cherishingscripturepodcast.com. Looks really uh, nice. Don't forget to sign up for that newsletter. It's we're hopefully again next few weeks we'll try to get that out. Um, and then, or you can listen to on any of your favorite podcast listening sites like iTunes. Um, and all of those are actually linked on the website. So they can they can listen to them on the website too, right? Yep. Yeah. So I'm gonna start sending actually, people there, man. Yeah, you can just listen to it. You just um, there's an audio tab there, and it'll it'll let you play, it and you can listen to it. Um, and then definitely check out our church's website, uh, BrandonBaptistTabernacle.com. Thousands and thousands of hours on there. Pastor just finished a David sermon, um, and we're doing a. Um, a um, a lead up to the cross. What, what, what yeah, uh, okay. Countdown to the cross. Countdown to the cross. Yeah. And all those are on the website. That's going to take well. us all the way to Resurrection Sunday. It's it's a great, great uh, series. Really. So, um, other than that, thank you for tuning in to Cherishing Scripture Podcast.